My name is Mary Sulerud. I am the Canon for Congregational Vitality. Just a quick reminder before we pray, this is being recorded. Um, and welcome to this webinar um, that while we still call it Vestry Vitality Day, we hope will be mostly um, a morning event and into early afternoon. And then you'll be able to enjoy this gorgeous day. Um, it's always good to begin with prayer, so let me start there, and then we will move into um, a few items so that we can go on with um, our presenters today. Let us pray. Gracious, loving, and faithful God, you call us to lead your church in challenging and anxious times. Keep us mindful that in Christ you are with us always. Open our hearts and our eyes to see you at work in new and joyful ways. Enlighten our minds to embrace the knowledge you offer. Guide our feet to trust your love and to serve your purpose. Amen. Amen. So welcome all. We are so glad you are here. Um, we have a number of terrific leaders who will be taking us through this morning. Um, and they include uh, Jay Boggs and Christopher Lind Payne, who are from St. Francis and Timonium, who will be talking in just a moment about um, the Cornerstone Project. We have Kristen Krantz, who is the director of the College for Congregational Development, who will be walking us through one of two models we are looking at today, the Gibbs um, Trust Theory, but we will be doing more and hearing more than theory. Um, we will also be hearing from Bill Thomas, who is a member at uh, St. Martin's in the Fields in Severna Park and an independent organization consultant. And he'll be walking us through um, William Bridges work around transition and then sending you into your small groups. And then finally, we'll wrap up our time together um, with a presentation from the Comp and Benefits Committee of the Diocese. And that includes Liz Haley and Anne, where are you, Anne? Wave to me, please. A Anne and Gross. Yep. And there's Anne Gross and Jason Poling, along with uh, Stuart Wright, who is the staff who oversees them. A um, couple of things. As you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat box. Both um, Jason Hoffman and I are monitoring the chat box so that after each presentation, we'll um, give you those questions, we'll offer those questions up to our presenters. Um, at the conclusion of this meeting today and early next week, we have materials that you will see that will be sent out again from our presenters so that you have them for yourselves especially the three questions we're using for our small groups today, because we wanna encourage you to use those in other small group settings. We will have a break um, at 10.15 for 10 minutes, or I'm watching the time, it will be slightly shorter if our presenters go over. And, um, but the important thing to remember is that we will start promptly at 10.25, because I wanna give Bill Thomas as much time as he needs to do his work too. Um, also during for our small group presentations, you will be randomly divided. When you get there, turn off your mute button, introduce yourselves, find somebody who'll keep some notes so that when we come back into the large group again, you can offer up what you learned. I think we're gonna have um, approximately 10 groups so we can keep the number of you small. So in a half hour, you all get some time to, to talk and work your way as much as you can through the questions. They're rich, so there's no A if you get through all of them or less than an A if you don't. So um, just follow where the spirit leads in those conversations. And I think that's it. So at this juncture, unless you have questions, I'm going to um, turn it over to Jay Boggs and to Christopher Lynn Payne to talk about the Cornerstone Project. 
Very good, Mary. Thank you very much. And uh, for those of you that I have not met, uh, good morning. My name is Jay Boggs. Uh, I am a parishioner here at St. Francis and one of the members of the Cornerstone team. And uh, we are we are very grateful to have this opportunity to share with you a little bit about Cornerstone, how it came into being, uh, where we are today, and uh, how we might be able to help you as a vestry member uh, as you navigate through these times. So Christopher, you wanna say hello? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Christopher Linpain, as Mary said. I'm one of the co-rectors at St. Francis Episcopal Parish and Community Center. And uh, just, uh, it's a gift to be able to have this time with you. Thanks for taking time out of this beautiful day to, uh, to talk about these things that really matter for our church as we move forward through these uncertain times. So uh, Jay has created a really uh, what I hope is a very powerful presentation here, and it 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 has me thinking all the time about what um, the new things that God is doing. So glad to be a part of it. Glad you're here. Great, thank you, Christopher. Uh, so um, we're going to go through uh, you know a brief presentation, hopefully, uh, and then leave time if we're efficient uh, in our presenting uh, for any questions. So please feel free to to use the reactions button to type in questions in the chat, and uh, uh, we'll we'll key off of that as we go through this. So uh, uh, just to start a little bit about how we came into being uh, here at St. Francis. Uh, uh, as a community, we, we have worked uh, rather diligently over the past, I'd say, decade to understand the challenges uh, that are before us as a faith community um, and to at least get one perspective uh, sort of of what some of those challenges may be. And uh, uh, this was one of those slides that we put together to sort of articulate uh, some of our perspective on that and trying to understand what's before us. But the, the, the most important thing to take from this is, is not the challenge, but um, the really the point at the very end, which is that now button there, is that um, it's really upon us to be able to, to act now. Uh, we can't wait for a solution. And, and you know once we really got to that point where we were ready to say it's time to act, um, it really did help us get started to understand, well, how do we respond to the challenges that are before us? Uh, and what we needed to do was to, to really empower uh, the laity of our church uh, to be able to seek new beginnings and new ways for us to help each other um, and to help the communities uh, that, that we build and are a part of. So, uh, um, and not just do that as, as individual communities, but as one community. So, uh, so, uh, so we felt that that was really important to do that. And as I put in here to authorize, if you will, the laity to be able to do that. Um, and as a result of that, what we found was is that the, the existing community center that we had was a great platform to be able to do that. So the, the community center aspect of our identity at St. Francis is something that's been emerging over the last decade, as Jay said. Um, for those of you who don't know, St. Francis is, a, is, I think, the newest congregation in the diocese. Uh, it's, the, um, it's the product of a merger that occurred in January of uh, 2020 between two former Episcopal churches, uh, St. Thomas and Providence Road and Epiphany uh, on Delaney, or off Delaney Valley. Um, but our, while there was a lot that we had in common, there was also a whole lot that was different in these two congregations. Um, that that slide, the slide where Jay named competition as a reality. I mean, I think this is so often the spirit of competition is something that undermines the work of God in our midst and prevents us from being able to partner with one another and really see the mission that we're called to and how do we creatively collaborate to do the work that we've been given. So the this community center aspect of our identity is I mean, it's just one way that congregations, um, I think one model how congregations can move forward. I think so many of our churches have lost connectivity with what it means to be a part of community. Uh, and I mean, there's this clear understanding for me that if we are commanded by, uh, by Jesus to love our neighbor as ourselves, how can you possibly do that if you don't know your neighbor? And so that deep connectivity that comes through listening, building relationship, um, and figuring out ways to act together. So our community center, um, that community center piece of what we do 
was a part of both the former St. Thomas and the former Epiphany, but we realized that as, as well as we could do separately, we could do so much more together. And I think that was a really important message for me to take away in this. So as we live in uh, these challenging pandemic times into uh, the moment that we're in, uh, we're finding that we're able to leverage the resources of all of these beloved people, all of these beloved um, talents and treasure and, and able to do a lot of really impactful work in areas of access to housing, um, food and education and deep care uh, for creation. So. Activity is there and Cornerstone has been integral to helping helping guide us through this process. Um, so yes. Um, so as we uh, so Cornerstone has been around for uh, a few years longer than than uh, than St. Francis has. And, and I've been beginning to think about Cornerstone as a, as a ministry before its time, that the vision for what we were hoping to do, I think is starting to really get traction in new ways, as many of us in congregations are realizing that um, as painful as the pandemic has, as great as the losses have been, there are also incredible opportunities to follow God as we do a new thing together. And Cornerstone is really helping St. Francis and, and, and a number of other congregations to step into that reality. But if you're familiar with the call of St. Francis of Assisi, uh, this call that he had by God as he prayed before a, a cross that looked a little bit like this one in a chapel in San Damiano, uh, where he heard um, the voice of God saying, Francis, rebuild my church, rebuild my house. And uh, this act of rebuilding is something that we have to remember that God is doing and that we are invited to participate in that. And I, I see this powerful image of God taking us stone by stone and helping us to rebuild. Um, I love this image that, that Jay found of St. Francis bending over. You can't quite see what's in his, what's in his hands, but the way that um, that invites us um, to really look more closely and to examine what we have in our hands and how we can offer that and how God has us in God's hands. Thank you, Christopher. So, so it, as we've been working with different congregations, we've been hearing a lot of different things. Um, uh, and so, I, when as we've been going through this, I thought I'd throw a few of them out on the screen for you to take a look at and see if any of them resonate with you. So, uh, um, I, I particularly one of my favorites is is the, and I think you might talk about it a little bit later in, in today's uh, agenda. But the 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 response I got to seek a what. So uh, that's that was always a very sort of funny thing for me uh, with my finance background. So uh, um, and then, you know, it really tugged at my heart to, to hear people that are leaders in the church that are trying and giving so much um, to love God, uh, love their neighbors and change the world and look at me and say, I just feel stupid. I just I there's so much here that I don't understand. I have no idea. You know, I know I'm supposed to, as a leader and a vestry member, um, understand my the finances of the church, but I don't. I don't get it. Um, I'm not. I don't. I see a number and it scares me. Um, and uh, you know, it's 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 been some interesting recurring themes in that area. So, uh, and and the one common is, you know, when I've talked to people that have been volunteers that are doing parish administration, doing wonderful ministry, that are just like it shouldn't really be this hard for us to operate a church today. Uh, and so these are some interesting things. I'm curious, uh, please use your reaction button if you've uh, felt like this or ever heard this from any of your peers in your churches. Uh, always interesting to see that um, as we go through this presentation. So, uh, um, and so from this, in our, our discussions, uh, talking with people, leaders during the uh, convention, the annual convention, um, you know, we, we focused Cornerstone in three core areas. And so as uh, places where we could actually help uh, other communities and congregations. And the first one 
uh, was really in the financial and bookkeeping services area. So uh, we saw a real need. Um, uh, every church has a need uh, to, to maintain their, their books and their finances. Um, but we saw a real need. Uh, so many churches didn't need a full-time bookkeeper or they were trying to use their parish administrator for bookkeeping purposes and um, they didn't have the skills uh, or didn't feel comfortable actually trying to do that. And so um, this has been an area that probably is at the top of the list when people ask us for help uh, is you know, help me get a budget established for my organization that is an engaging process that allows us to be able to um, inject um, excitement into ministry uh, by, by, believe it or not, through the financial budgeting process um, uh, and help us to be able to keep our books and our finances in a way that we can say that we're executing uh, according to that budget and that we know ahead of time if something's not working. Uh, so, um, you know, help us to be able to keep our church management system up and running so that it can be engaging to our congregation and that they can feel like that's one way to be able to connect to our community. Um, and, you know, there's a series of very special projects that we've been able to do with various congregations, uh, all oriented in this way. Um, one of those, and one of the things I wanted to leave with you that was really interesting over the last five years is that that, that concept that I told you about with vestry members not really understanding when they see this gigantic financial statement every month, uh, we implemented this little process called a key performance indicator or KPI metric sheet. Uh, and every church that I work with right now actually has this as part of their financial reporting, where it's a basic red light, green light report. And what it does is it be able, uh, the vestry decides what key areas they want to look at. Um, and uh, we publish this every month as part of the financial package with our churches. Um, some vestries decide uh, that um, uh, some vestries decide that uh, um, this is all they want to look at uh, two out of the three months of the quarter um, to make sure that, that they're, you know, how things are going uh, and it helps them to satisfy their fiduciary duty. So uh, uh, to be able to make sure that they understand what's going on financially with their church. But just a simple one page red light, green light report really has changed the way that people think about their role and their ability to be able to manage uh, the, the finances of the church church, excuse me. The other thing that we've worked with with uh, all of our churches uh, and, and working through uh, the process is putting, you know, a proactive uh, budget, structured budget process uh, uh, in uh, so that uh, we can work with them to make sure that it gets uh, in place. It gets in place and it doesn't um, uh, conflict with the major seasons uh, of our church year, uh, and that it's an engaging and positive experience for people. Uh, for many people that have been involved in the budget process, uh, they tell me that it's not necessarily engaging or fun to go through this. Uh, uh, but our goal is to make it that way, to make it a part of uh, enlivening and enriching uh, the ministries that you have in your church, uh, and to be able to, frankly, to be able to get it done before Advent. So uh, uh, so we've, we've been working through and refining a process uh, for working with budgets and getting budgets done, because um, it's so important to be able to do that uh, as part of your um, uh, financial processes. We also offer and have worked with congregations for a series of communications activities. Uh, we, we have uh, two communications missioners on our staff that work uh, on social media, website design. Uh, we uh, help people with their bulletins, um, including printing services around that so that they can uh, prepare their bulletins in advance and then we deliver them to them. Um, uh, as well as a series of other special communication projects, be it a special marketing initiative, uh, um, uh, maybe even communications around stewardship activities. So uh, um, we've been able to, to help in, the, in this area um, and be able to provide some perspective of what has been working uh, and what we're starting to see to be some best practices. And this, this is a companion service to all the great services that the diocese provides as well. 
Uh, finally, uh, one of the things that we've actually started to get involved in more and more is what I'll call these management consulting projects. So things that sort of uh, springboard out of the work that we do and becoming, if you will, a trusted advisor. Uh, um, and uh, these are some of the areas that we've been working on. Um, the, the concept of strategic planning uh, is starting to, interestingly enough, post-pandemic, um, is starting to go through a complete transformation um, um, and talking about planning um, after going through the event of the last 18 months is, is taking on new and different uh, meanings. So uh, uh, working through that process and understanding you know, what's important today when it comes to planning uh, has been an interesting topic for everybody, as well as uh, the, two t the two topics at the, at the beginning of this seem to be resonating almost in every community we're talking about. Uh, understanding how to move from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset, and how do we empower our leaders uh, to transform and to build and renew um, all fascinating places uh, for us to be able to help and work with, with uh, congregations. Uh, this is our team uh, of Cornerstone Missioners right now. Um, amazing people um, uh, have been involved, uh, have seen that their call is to, uh, to execute ministry uh, through the areas of administration. So, uh, uh, and we're looking for two more people uh, to join us because uh, we are growing. Uh, uh, the message is getting out uh, and we're really, really happy to be able to help. So, uh, uh, so I'm very proud of all the work that each of these people have been doing uh, and uh, look forward for this team to continue and grow uh, and hopefully become, uh, have conversations with you in the days to come. Christopher, anything you want to say to wrap this up before we open the floor for any questions or thoughts? No, I think the most important thing is to leave some space for you all to to, to ask questions you uh, you may have, um, because I, I know even as part of creating this presentation, like it brings up so many questions of 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 possibility, and it brings me a lot of hope for what we can do together. So, um, so thank you, Jay. Sure thing. If you have questions, please be sure and put them in the chat box. One question we did have is if we will share these slides with the group after this meeting, and I believe the answer to that is yes. Definitely. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? And we're actually, just so everybody knows, we're actually going through a transition right now of our own website. So uh, under St. Francis, so uh, um, uh, there'll be more materials up there uh, for you to see in the days and weeks to come. Here's a question. How large is the congregation at St. Francis? That's a very interesting question. Um, I, uh, how does one answer that? Um, you know, in a, in a pandemic, uh, when we are churches really beginning to rethink how we measure, um, what are our metrics of vitality? Uh, you know, so, I mean, we, we look at things like uh, average Sunday attendance, but what in this time when digital ministry is, a, is an integral part of what many of our congregations are doing, and a lot of that is happening at times that is not Sunday. I mean, at St. Francis, we have offerings that go out every day of the week and how people engage through that. Um, so in terms of, uh, and then the other piece that also adds some complexity to answer in the question is that our merger took place, we had seven Sundays together before the shutdown. And so I guess the, the study that we did before was that when a merger took place, you could, you could lose a lot of people on that. And uh, to date, it's a very small number of families that we've lost because of the merger. But as the pandemic continues to roll on, and um, uh, it's hard to know really who is who is in our congregations. I know at St. Francis, we have many new people that have arrived and we've been worshiping outside uh, for over a year now. We continue to have in-person uh, and virtual offerings as well as uh, the outside. So, um, uh, and then the other piece of this is that uh, St. Francis is an Episcopal parish. We're super clear about that identity, but we're also a community center that operates uh, programs that are impacting thousands of families at this point. So the scale is really difficult to measure when you think not only about um, 
at worship attendance, but also weekly impact. Um, so uh, I know that that doesn't answer the question, but I'm pushing against the the um, the the ways that we usually measure how we understand ourselves as community. Thank you. A couple of quick things. Is there um, a cost to the congregation um, for these services? Can you give a rough idea of what that might be? And um, then um, I'll go to the second, go to the cost and then I'll go to some other questions here. Sure, it's a great question. Um, uh, so for our, for our finance work that we do um, with churches, There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, our what our goal is: we are a nonprofit entity. We are part of St. Francis, uh, and and our goal, working with churches, is to be able to actually reduce your cost by joining you. So, uh, um, and so our services for the finance work, we do charge for that. And we charge fees to cover the cost of the individuals that work for us, plus any of the systems that we need to purchase to be able to support you. One example would be that uh, um, we purchase a QuickBooks uh, subscription for most of the churches that we work with uh, in order to be able to operate the books uh, for that. Um, and what we're finding is, is that the cost um, there's a minimum cost for the finance work we do that's around $500 a month, and that can go up and sort of scales up depending on the size of the church and what the needs are. Uh, so we also, uh, as far as our, our communication services are concerned, uh, we do that according to what the need is. Um, and uh, um, so um, they're typically not that expensive, frankly, when it comes to our website design services, uh, as well as just our maintenance of social media presence. Um, and then the other uh, projects uh, um, are all done on a, you know, a, a quotation basis, um, and you, you can design what you'd like to see in that. And take it from there. Yeah. So could you elaborate on what you mean by church management system? Sure. So, uh, um, so uh, a lot of people have been involved in in uh, tools like uh, I'll, I'll throw some names out that people might know Breeze or Touchpoint or Elvanto. Uh, these are all tools that allow you to be able to build your database of your congregation, keep all their vital information. Uh, many of these tools allow you to be able to accept online uh, contributions. Um, and to be able to have uh, your congregation log in uh, and get uh, key information. Uh, so some of these tools also allow you to be able to have like, for example, an app on your, on your phone that allows you to zoom right in to see all the relevant information that's going on, all the key marketing uh, information that's happening and in, in the things that are going on within the church. Um, uh, Check-in features, uh, sign-ups for special events. Uh, that's a church management system. So, uh, and typically for most uh, church management systems is the non-financial side of um, uh, supporting the congregation. Uh, and most of these systems now are all based in the cloud, so which allows your congregation to, to, to log in remotely to be able to access that information. So I have a question here. How can you help with web page design? Ours is in serious need of a refresh. Yeah, I've heard, <laughs> I've heard that quite often. Uh, um, so Allie and Lisa are our two communications missioners, and Allie is um, a brand designer and website designer, and uh, uh, they will um, uh, meet with you. Uh, they'll get a tour of your current uh, website and give you some recommendations of what they think is the best way for you to move forward. Um, and then uh, depending on whether you want to um, uh, reinvent some of your branding, um, new logos, uh, new visuals, they'll help you go through that process and they'll help you design sort of a site map of what you'd like to see on your website uh, and to be able to help you actually execute that uh, and then maintain it on an ongoing basis. Um, because these are, these are not necessarily static tools. They're really tools that are supposed to be engaging and enlivening um, uh, the interaction between you and your community. So to go back again, um, because there was another question about costs, they're not based on parish size. They really are related to what you're asking asking for yeah 
Yeah, and it's really, uh, honestly, it's it's really built to cover our costs. So uh, uh, of our missioners and the work that they're doing, because they view this as a ministry. Um, uh, there's some of us that do this on a volunteer basis, um, and there are others that are actually paid staff. Uh, and uh, so um, we, we really build um, uh, uh, the model according to the ability uh, to be able to contribute to it, as well as what the actual need is. So friends, are there other questions for our two presenters? Ah, here's one. Um, is the community of lay leaders an organized group or an ad hoc number of persons who volunteer? Uh, yes, is the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> Very good, well said. So, uh, so Part of my background and training is in community organizing. And one of the universals that it teaches is that all organizing is disorganizing and reorganizing. So why is that matter right now? When you think about, I mean, how many of us in the church have heard people make comments like, well, we've always done it that way. You get used to just the same patterns. Well, the this pandemic has really interrupted almost all of the patterns that we have. And you know, so we, uh, at St. Francis, I mean, we are we are constantly organizing and disorganizing and reorganizing our structures of how we how we uh, we organize our people, our lay leaders together. So some of that are you know have standing committee structures, and some of them are more like ad hoc that they rise and fall with the need for things. But I mean, in this pandemic, as we've had to experiment, and I think all of us have to do that in in some way. You know, when you discover because you're constantly evaluating what is working and what's not, you have to stop doing things so you can start doing new things. You can't do it all. And so um, you know, just learning how, I mean, I think the Episcopal Church is really good at holding tightly onto things, uh, not just Episcopalians, of course, but humans in general, but learning to let go of that and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us in new and different ways that honor the tradition of what it means to be an Episcopalian, but but breathe fresh fresh expressions into how uh, God is calling us to become the church today. Um, so we have a final question, I think. But I, I always say that, and then there'll be three more. Um, how do we initiate exploring a relationship with you all? Send, send us an email. Introduce yourself. Uh, uh, yeah, you're more than welcome uh, to do that. Um, uh, and when I respond back, you'll get all of my information, including a link to be able to book a meeting. Uh, so you, you, I, I would love to hear from you. Um, and we can explore a little bit how we might be able to help. Mary, I, I saw that Adrian popped into the chat there also. I just, as, as you named at the start of this, Adrian, uh, just returning from sabbatical, uh, was blown away by uh, the way that you led into and through that and your engagement of Cornerstone in that process. And while I know you're only recently back, it's been beautiful to watch the work of Cornerstone unfolding at All Saints. Um, so um, thanks for, for jumping into the chat there to say that, that you'd be willing to share your experience with anyone who wants to talk about that because Adrian is just one of uh, many leaders that we're getting a chance to work with. Thank you for that. Adrian is again, the rector at All Saints and Frederick. Anyone else? Thank you so much for Thank being able to be with you. Thank you for being yeah. here, um, yay. <laughs> and if you have other questions, email them to Jay or to Christopher and they'd be glad to answer them and um, reach out to you. And Adrian Dawson has just put her email in the chat so that you can reach out to Adrian as well. Um, and lots of thanks for your being here today. Um, so what I'd like to do since we're, um, we're moving right along and on time, actually a little early, is I'd like to turn to um, Kristen Krantz to have her um, present trust development theory. Um, as I said at the beginning, Kristen is our um, director of our College for Congregational Development that had its first uh, gathering this past summer and we'll have another next summer 2022 at Claggett. And um, Kristen's also the rector of uh, St. James Mount Airy. Um, 
and true to form with Mount Airy, the church sits way on top of a hill. It's really lovely. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to um, present about trust development theory. Hey, thanks, Mary. Hi, everyone. Um, well, Mary just did my introduction, so I won't repeat all of that, <laughs> Sorry. Um, which is great, which is great. Um, but I'm really excited to be here today. And I am going to talk about trust development theory, which sounds very heady and academic, and it kind of is, but I'm going to give you a practical application of it by the time we get to the end. But I also want to just share a little bit about the college, because, um, because while trust development theory obviously exists independent of the college, I want to use the framework of the college because I want to encourage you all to think about this for your congregations as well. So I'm going to go ahead and um, get my, get the right Microsoft PowerPoint going. So I will just tell you that um, in the college, we are very low tech. We use newsprint chart pads and markers. And we do this for a couple of reasons. Um, any ideas? Can unmute yourself, throw them out there. Why would why do you think we would choose to use just regular old paper and markers? More friendly. It can be more friendly, it can definitely be more interactive when you're in person. Other thoughts? Financially accessible. Yeah, exactly. And also, you don't have to have any skills like PowerPoint is not my strong, strong suit. Let me just tell you that. Um, I mean, I can do it, but I don't have the patience to add all the beautiful bells and whistles. Uh, but so newsprint and markers makes it accessible to every congregation so that what you learn at the college, you can take back to your congregation without having to have lots of um, lots of tech experience, lots of equipment. You don't have to worry about any of that. That being said, newsprint and markers do not work on Zoom, so I'm kind of doing the best I can here. But to talk a little bit about the college, what is it? The college is a comprehensive training program that seeks to equip lay leaders and clergy in both congregational and organization development. Uh, we really focus on congregational teams. This is not just something for your clergy to come to. We want teams. Is that two people? Is that five people? Every congregation is different, but we want teams because we believe that lay leadership is essential. Clergy come and go. We know that if we want to have healthy, sustainable, faithful communities for the long term, we need to have strong lay leaders. And so this program is very much designed for congregational teams. The college is a two-year program, which sounds really overwhelming, but let me say you come for a week-long summer, and then you come back the next summer for a week long session. So it spans the course of a year and it is a commitment of two weeks summer apart, but it's not, um, it's not as, as intimidating as a two year program can sound. When you come to the college, we teach congregational development and organization de development models, theories. We te teach about group and team dynamics, conflict and change facilitation skills and best practices. You, you learn intercultural competency and communication and conflict styles and a lot, lot more. So what is congregational development? I wanna give you just a few working terms here. So congregational development is the development of congregations of all sizes, locations, conditions into more healthy, faithful and effective communities of faith. You do not have to be a large congregation to be healthy. You do not have to be an urban congregation to be healthy. Congregations can be healthy, faithful, and effective, all sizes and any location. And we have some sort of markers for how we judge. How are you more faithful, healthy, and effective? It means that you're focused on and faithful to your unique reason for being and primary task as a congregation. So, um, your congregation's focus might be outreach. Another's might be education and formation. Um, there's lots and lots of different ways. You don't need to be another congregation. You need to be who you are. We um, help people become connected to and expressive of their unique ecclesial tradition, ethos, and character. So we're Episcopalians. What does it mean to be an Episcopalian and how can we leverage these wonderful things about our faith tradition? Um, and use them effectively. 
We also want congregations to be self-renewing and responsive to challenges and opportunities. Who boy, let me tell you, that's what we've all been doing for the last 18 months, isn't it? Um, we think that um, we're working with, we, we are training to train congregations so they can be sustainable. We're working towards greater, greater sustainability in terms of a fit between the elements of your organization. So that means what's your vision, vision for ministry, your leadership, size, your culture, your overall size, your property, your finances, all of these pieces. And also we think that healthy, faithful, and sustainable, um, effective congregations foster cultures of transparency, collaboration, courage, flexibility, and forgiveness, um, which all give us a greater sense of choice. So that's just a working definition of congregational development. And you will be getting um, all the stuff I'm talking about. You will be getting all of this after the session as well. So what, what then is organization development? Well, the biggest difference is that congregational development is specifically focused on faith communities, whereas organization development comes to us from the secular world, both nonprofits and business. So I'm hoping you can see this iceberg model here. Um, and you can, we all know the image of the iceberg, right? You see, you see what you see above the waterline, but under the waterline, there's always so much more. And those are the things that you actually need to pay attention to because those can sink your ship. So the things above the waterline in organizations are things like job descriptions, your functional areas, your hierarchy, your mission and goals and objectives that you have written down, your stated values, your policies and practices, all of those things that you can say and see out loud. But what's under the waterline in any organization are things like power and influence, who's really calling the shot the patterns for individual and group interaction, um, the norms, trust issues, emotions, all of these things, dynamics and culture. And so organization development um, deals with what's under the iceberg. So all of the models and theories that are for OD as we call it, are all deal with these things that are under the iceberg. And these are the things that really we need to pay attention to if we want to build healthy, faithful, and effective communities of faith. So the last little bit of pre-work that I'm gonna offer you is this idea of models as lenses. So in the college, when we're talking about models and theories, we often use this idea of lenses. So right now I have on my computer glasses. These are my glasses that let me see mid-range and have some reading to them so I can do close work. These are my regular progressives that give me some distance, a little bit of mid-range, but also readers. These are what I wear all of the time. And of course I have my very cool and stylish sunglasses for when it is a bright day out and I'm driving around or hiking. All of these glasses let me see things a little bit different because the lenses show the world to me in slightly different ways. And that's what models and theories allow us to do. We pick them up and put them on. And when we look through them, they show us something about our faith communities. Not everything, but they help us see them in particular ways. And the ways in which they help us see can then help us discern how it is that we need to be leaders in the midst of our congregations. So one of the um, models that we are going to be looking at today, or the model, Bill has got another really great one um, coming up after the break, but the model that I'm gonna get into with you is called trust development theory. So I'm gonna ask you to stick with me because at first it's gonna seem very heady, but I promise I will get to the good practicality towards the end. So trust development theory um, was developed by a man named Jack Gibbs. You can see there, uh, Gibb lived from 1914 to 1995. He is considered one of the grandfathers of organization development. And he is the original proponent of the importance of trust in team dynamics and organizational behavior. So the questions, um, Gibbs, let me, before I get there, um, before I get to that, let me just go back a little bit. Um, well, no, I'll, I'll go ahead with these questions. Okay, so um, organization development, I'll st first start by saying, began to be a field that began to be developed in the 1950s. And to be really crass, it was developed because there are a lot of business people were like, 
how can we make our, our businesses and our organizations more effective so we can make more money? That was part of, part of, not all of it, but that was part of the, the driving factor behind the beginning of what became OD. Over time, and Gib was a huge piece of this, it began to be more focused on people. So how is it that we can empower and get people? And because those, those are the most important part. And this is huge for churches, right? Because we have very few paid people. We have lots of people that we depend on for ministry and for work though. So how is it that we are building communities that are effective? So questions started to be, to, to come up. Questions like, what makes some groups more effective than others? And why do some groups seem to have more fun and work productively more so than others? And we all spend probably hours in both meetings and on committees. Um, and you've probably thought this too. And maybe it's at work or maybe it's in your church. Why does this committee work really well and we get our work done, but this committee or this group, it seems like we're always spinning our wheels. It can be hard and we, we often lack the understanding of how groups work. Sometimes we'll think, okay, well, it's just an effective leader, somebody who's very charismatic, or we'll say, well, that team has all the good people on it that are really committed and, you know, we know we can trust them to get things done. Or maybe we say, well, this team has really skilled and competent people. And those things might be true, but that's not really the secret behind what makes groups effective. Um, and once we understand what makes groups effective, that's how we can begin to then figure out where the pinches are that are keeping us from getting our work done and our mission and our vision accomplished and come up with strategies to be more effective. So Jack Gibbs theory of group development describes how groups work together and how trust and productivity occur. And this is his big idea. His big idea is that as trust increases in any system or organization or group, defensive and unproductive behavior, behavior decreases. And this allows individuals and groups to then be more effective in their work. And this is what all of his work is based off of. Now, he bases this on an understanding and an assumption that humans are by nature social beings. And that it is when we come together and work in groups and these interactions that help us to grow as people. And here's a quote from him. He states that a person learns to grow through their increasing acceptance of themselves and others, serving as the primary block to such acceptance, um, our defensive feelings of fear and distrust that arise from the prevailing defensive climates of most, most cultures. Kind of heady, but what he means here is that all of us, when we come into a new group and we're unsure of ourselves and we don't know others, we always have that little bit of fear and distrust um, and perhaps even defensiveness until we get to know people, until we understand how things work, until we can trust that our ideas and voice will be heard and that we will be accepted. And so in order to overcome all of those feelings of fear and distrust, we have to be intentional in what we do. And that's where he comes up with this framework. So his, here's his framework, which I know is kind of hard to see on here. Normally it would be big, beautiful um, newsprint, but I'm not doing newsprint today, but I will blow this up a little bit. But his framework here is that he identified four primary concerns that he saw rise up in all social interactions and then he paired those with what he called expressed or derivative concerns. So let's look at these primary concerns. Um, the first one is that a first concern that we all have when we're um, in groups is acceptance. Who, you know, who am I? Who am I in this group in relation to others? Another concern that we always have is data flow. It's the sharing of feelings and other data and information. This is both verbal and nonverbal. Another concern we have is goal formation and alignment of um, integration of motivations. So what are we here for? What's our purpose? Are we working towards the same purpose? And the final one is control that is exerting influence over what happens. So how are we gonna actually accomplish this goal? 
the expressed or derivative concerns that match up with these are membership, who belongs, who is valued, who's listened to, decision-making, who makes decisions and how are they made, productivity, can we learn, grow, and be creative together, and organization, how are we structured, how will we collaborate creativity, creatively, pardon me. Um, so in, under word, in other words, these underlying, these are the underlying um, hidden needs, these pr primary concerns, but people don't come into a group and wonder who am I? They come into a group and say, do I belong here? Who belongs here? Who is valued in this group? And so we're back to that, we're back to that iceberg again, right? Where the expressed concerns are about membership and decision-making and productivity and organization but those match up to the things that are underneath the waterline, which are acceptance, data flow, goal formation, and control. I hope you're with me. I did a mad dash through, through this theory. There's a lot more to it, and I'd be happy to share more, even more resources than what I'll be sending you, um, or you'll be sent after this, if you want to dig deeper. But this is the basic um, the basic thrust of um, Gibbs theory. And, um, oops, I got to go back. Pretend you didn't just see Mary Berry, um, because I want to talk a little bit about how this all comes together into a framework that um, Gibbs said. So does anybody, do I have any fans of the Great British Baking Show here? Yay. And what does Mary Berry always say? Nobody likes a soggy bottom, right? Nobody likes the soggy bottom. In other words, when you are building a cake or any sort of tiered baked item, you have to have that solid base because if you have a soggy bottom layer, then the whole cake will topple over. And that is how I like to think about this framework that Gibbs offers us. So here is his cake. So before we go ahead with the yeah. cake, um, Toppers, Galaxy, S9 had a hand up. Yes. So do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? I, I hit that by accident. I'm sorry. Okay. So continue. Thank you. Okay. Dope. So here's our cake. And our cake, the bottom layer is acceptance and membership. And then our next layer up is data flow and decision making. And our third tier is the goal formation and productivity. And our top tier is control and organization. And if you read from the bottom, we have this really great statement here. As people enter a group and feel confident of their belonging and value, up to the second tier, they shed roles and give up postures that inhibit the flow of vital information which allows them to explore options more openly up to the third tier, where people are then able to choose courses of action and goals which are committed toward, they are committed toward, which they are capable of working on productively, and up to our final top tier to coordinate and collaborate freely and creativity. So basically at the bottom, here, and I'm going to do some really bad annotation here, you guys, because um, I don't have a touch screen. But you can see here that we are building the layers up. You've got to start with your trust at the bottom of who belongs and feeling valued. And then we move our way up to get to goal formation and being able to identify what our work is, and then actually being able to do our work. Now, all of these also, remember we've got our iceberg work here. So when we talk about membership, the underlying piece is acceptance. When we talk about decision-making, our underlying piece is data flow. We talk about productivity, our underlying piece is this goal formation. And when we talk about control, our, our organization, our underlying piece is control. All of this points to this dependable order that helps us build groups that can work effectively together. I don't know about you, but I have certainly been involved in teams or committees or groups where it seems like we just can't get a clarity around 
what it is we're doing, right? Like there's trying to herd too many cats or people are solo, you know, lone rangering and doing their own things and not focusing on a goal of which everyone is committed to. Or I've worked in groups where there's always one person who is not passing on information reliably, or it's a team where one person dominate, dominates the conversation all the time and other people just sit back and are quiet. So they're not sharing their ideas and information. All of this, when we encounter things like this, when we encounter these pinches, these little roadblocks, one of the things that Gibbs model teaches us is whatever pinch we're feeling, that means we actually need to bump down a layer and bolster up and do work on the level below. So when I'm working on a team that's having a hard time clarifying and setting our goal, chances are that means the work that we actually need to be doing is coming back down here to data flow and decision making. It means that we don't all have the same information and we need to get clear on that first. And once we are clear, on this vital information and on how it is we're communicating, then we will be able to get up here and have a clearer goal. Same thing here. If we are not having vital information and people are not participating, chances are it's because somebody doesn't feel valued. Somebody doesn't feel like they belong. Somebody doesn't feel safe and trusted. So this is, um, that is a quick, dirty run through of of the model, before I get into how we actually use this in congregations, I'm gonna turn off screen share for a second because I can't see you guys when the screen is sharing. Um, does anybody have basic questions before I move on? Because I know that was a whole lot of theory in a whole brief amount of time. Let's go forward, Kristen. I don't see anything okay. right now. Okay, so I'm going to share two stories. I'm going to leave my screen share off for the moment, um, but I'm going to share two stories of um, how I have used this model, one COVID related and one not. I'm going to start with the non COVID related one actually. So knowing that this bottom level is trust, right? This is all about trust and value and membership. It's all about um, acceptance and knowing that people need to feel accepted and like they are members and valued before you can get on to actually doing the work you're called to do. So this year, my congregation had three major retirements in three months. Our longtime, nearly 40 year business manager for our nursery school retired at the end of May. Um, our longtime um, super competent and over-functioning treasurer stepped back from ministry at the end of June. And our longtime wonderful nursery school director of almost 20 years retired at the end of July. That's a lot of huge transition and major, major leadership pieces all kind of wrapping up within a few months. Now we knew this was coming. We knew this back in December and January. So we had some time to plan for it. And, um, and it allowed us to be creative actually, because our treasurer was really kind of functioning as the business manager for both the church and our thrift shop. And so with the retirement of both the treasurer and the business manager for the school, we were able to create a new position that is just a business manager for all three entities. Um, but even doing that, that was a lot of prep work there. I still had to hire three new people into new roles and because we were creating a new position and because we had new people coming in, all of our structures, our communication patterns, all of that was completely disrupted. So over the course of a few months, I hired three new people. And we had a lot of work to do because people were picking up things. We shifted some things into different roles. And so we needed to come up with things like um, a new org chart and we needed to come up with new processes and we needed to establish new communication norms because there were new people. But I knew that we weren't gonna be able to get to any of that higher level work if we didn't first do that really important work of acceptance and a membership and that bottom layer of the cake and getting it really solid. And so I spent a lot of time the spring, summer and into the fall 
really working with my new leadership team to build trust in, in that and, and value um, and membership in that lowest level. And so this looked like turning to some tried and true team building skills, you know, um, team building tools, like activities for people to just get to know each other because we had new people coming into the system. It was doing the work of continuing to clarify roles and responsibilities because those had shifted. It was setting up a new and clear communication structure because a lot of the informal ways that we had been holding these pieces no longer were going to work. And it was also working together to build this process map, but, and again, this is about creating trust so that people feel like they can share communication, share information. This is about creating trust so that people feel valued and can offer ideas. We created this process map with the understanding that for the first three months, we were gonna just hold it really lightly, knowing that there were gonna be some pinches, some things that weren't working out the way we anticipated they would or the way we hoped they would, and that we would need to make some course corrections along the way. And so setting up those expectations and doing that groundwork of team building has allowed for this to be a fairly knock on wood so far, painless, but big transition in our system because we were doing that work intentionally around acceptance and membership before we really built the cake up to those higher level things. So that's a way that for something new, I was able to use this model and to plan and be strategic about how we were going to enter into ministry together. We don't always have the opportunity to plan for something from the ground up, i.e. the pandemic. So here's my COVID um, example of how we used this model, this theory. Um, so everything shuts down in mid-March of 2020 and um, realize that decision-making and here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna screen share again because I wanna look at that cake um, with you again. And Kristen, it's, 10, it's close to 10.05, just so you Perfect. remember. Perfect. Let me go back to screen to this so that we can just look at it together. Big, great. Okay, so I'm looking at the cake again. So I knew when the pandemic happened that all of this higher level stuff was, was just torched, right? So much of this, how we were making decisions, how we were, um, how we were just making things happen, just the, all of those structures and things that supported the way that we do church, those were just torched and they were out the window. And so get, again, Gibbs model tells us that if you're feeling pinches here or here or here, you need to bump down a level and shore up that level in order to build up again. Kind of like Christopher was saying in organization, right? You're always, things are always being pulled apart to be rebuilt. And so I knew that with everything else changing, that we really needed to focus all of our time and attention down here, not all of it, but we needed to focus and really put some time and attention towards acceptance and membership. So we came up with our catchphrase and our catchphrase that we used on everything was stay church, stay connected, take care of each other. And that informed everything we did at the start of the pandemic. And so how was it that we could, as we were pulled apart physically, focus on acceptance and membership and making sure that we had that basic level of people feeling like they belonged, they were valued, they were still present when we couldn't be present together? Well, the first thing we did was we divided up the directory and we had the vestry members call and reach out and make a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one connection with everyone in the congregation a quick check-in. Were there things they needed? Did they have prayer requests? Kind of to take to the temperature of the room. And from there, then we decided we needed to form small groups for sort of mutual aid. It was a way to, again, help people stay connected, which kind of bumps us up into this next level of the cake too, around information and data flow and decision-making. And so we divided everyone in the whole congregation into groups of six to eight people. We called them grace groups. We recruited some folks that we called shepherds who each had a few groups that they kind of um, would be in touch with regularly. And we invited every group 
to be in touch, whether that was via email or phone calls or whatever worked for them. They could set up Zooms if they wanted, but to be in touch regularly to support one another and to check in with one another. And those shepherds then would be in regular touch with each of the groups to see if there were things that needed to be passed on. Was somebody having tech difficulties and couldn't use Zoom? Um, did somebody need someone to run to uh, CVS to pick up a prescription for them or groceries at the store? Um, what prayer requests were going on? Was anyone ill? Did they have a family member that was in the hospital? And so we were able to keep this data flow going on and we were able to use those groups to feed information to people pretty quickly as well because we weren't seeing everyone on Sundays anymore, right? So a lot of these informal ways that we had of um, data flow, uh, which as you know, the more data you have, the more choices you have for making decisions, those were cut off. And so we intentionally worked to bolster up these two bottom layers of the cake so that that would help us in the midst of all of the craziness of of the beginning of the pandemic when we were changing things all the time that helped us keep those two layers solid so that we had a better chance of actually being effective in this upper level work that we were doing. So those are my two examples of how this model has informed some of the leadership choices, strategy and ministry that we have done in my congregation. So, so the take Go ahead, because I've got yeah. several questions. Cool. And I'm, I'm wrapping up and then we will go to questions. So the takeaways from, from Gib here in trust development theory is that as trust increases, defensive and unproductive behavior decreases, um, that you can use this when creating or entering um, an organization to ensure that trust develops, but you can also use it to troubleshoot areas where you're experiencing these pinches in your congregation. So if you hit a roadblock, then you know, you just take a look down. What's going on down below, the level below, because that might help me strengthen what needs to be strengthened so that we can get the upper level work done. And that's it for me for, um, for that. So we've got some questions, yeah. So what is bubbling up here is um, a, a back and a forth, and then I'll, I'll roll it over yeah. to you. Um, what was asked was, what are some things we can do to build confidence in younger members to prepare them for leadership roles? That's the big thing. Yeah. And uh, Karen Kretschmann, who is visiting with us from the ELCA staff, um, offers up a book called Growing Young by Powell, Mulder, and Griffin, which is about our need to adapt to allow leadership. So, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you, as well as lots of kudos for what you're doing and your examples. So what can we do, would you suggest to prepare younger members for leadership? Um, well, I mean, if I'm using the, if I'm using the lens of, of trust development theory and what Gib, Gib offers us here, then I think that you really, the first thing you need to do is to really work with them on getting them solidly feeling like they are um, a full member of your congregation that they that they are their gifts and talents are valued it's it's that whole idea of grafting them in and so that for me would look like probably one-on-ones with folks to hear about what they're passionate about to learn what their gifts and talents are so i could match them with the work that needs to be done in a congregation um, but Gibbs would tell us, Gib tells us that that first work that we need to do is to make sure that people really do feel like they are accepted and full members of our organization. And sort of the next piece up around that then is communication, because if people feel like they are accepted and valued, then they are more likely to share openly with us. And that's when we can enter into discernment with them around and what kind of leadership they are called into. So I see that Adrian has her hand up. Is yeah. there? I just wanted Kristen, ab what Kristen shared absolutely is like how you create the, how you invite the community to recognize the membership and the leadership of that younger generation. I also know that when you start to do that, the older generation in the congregation feels like you just pulled the bottom layer of their cake out. 
and they don't belong anymore. And you start hearing, um, you can get a lot of reactive behavior in the congregation because people, and this, I'm using language that I've heard it, into my ears, I feel irrelevant. Um, I don't know who's running this place. Like there's a sense of distrust mm -hmm. that you, amongst your, out, your congregation that have been the kind of backbone and the workhorse and, and they kid, they've been saying, we're so tired, we wish younger people, why won't they step up? Part of the other piece of it is getting folks to step back, not to be irrelevant, but to become the wisdom and, the, and to have a different role to play and, and maintain trust. So I just, I want to, I just yep. throw that in there because and, as, and what you're, yeah, what yeah. you're speaking to is again, below the waterline power and yeah. influence. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, and so that's, and so you, you're going to have to do multiple, you're going to have to hold multiple threads because um, you have to then also build the trust with those, with those folks. So you have to circle back to those folks and figure out how it is that you are working with them so that they continue to feel valued. And like you said, and so that can be conversation work around what a, a change in, in role looks like. And um, what I'd like to have you do is because it's, it's easy for clergy because we tend to have an outsized role in um, work around the soggy bottom. If you could address that, because I think there's some, the, for those of us who are on this webinar today who are clergy there, I think there might be a special word for us. Is there? <laughs> Mary, tell me what you're thinking. I don't know your thoughts. Tell me what you're um, thinking. I think that one of the things that we have to be particularly mindful when we engage in membership mm -hmm. is allowing the room to speak. We have a place to speak, but we need to be in, incredibly conscious of the fact that our speech tends to kind of overpower a group. Oh, and yeah. take up more space than, than just, you know, we're not, we're not um, an equal among equals typically. Yeah. And so, um, so are you thinking like for breakout rooms and just in general, even within our congregations that are, that clergy words can sometimes have that power and influence, even if we're not intending them. Is that what you're exactly. trying to? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so exactly. Um, and so that's a piece that comes in around, um, you know, data flow and, and information, right? So being aware of groups, if, and this doesn't have to be a clergy person, but being aware of the power of our words, have I spoken three times and other people haven't spoken at all yet? So that's some good individual work that we can all do that are important in groups. So one more question, and then we're going to go to break. Sure. How do you show value to members of the L LGBTQ plus community in a congregation? Hmm. That's a really great question. And I hope this isn't a non-answer, but, um, but I don't know that because that, because that's not, I'm not a member of that community. So what I would want to do if I was looking to make sure folks within that identity were in my congregation felt valued is again, for me, it would come back to conversation and one-on-ones and, um, and finding and, and listening to people. That's, that's my default thing though, you guys, is, is having conversations and trying to listen to people. Be, but what I would, um, but I do think there are probably just some broader things that, uh, as clergy people, and I know we are not all clergy people, this is Vestry Vitality Day, not Clergy Vitality Day, but, um, but as a clergy person and as leaders of your congregation, um, what theology are we pro proclaiming from the pulpit and within our um, liturgies, uh, worship, that seems like a place to me um, where value can be an overt above the iceberg, um, above the waterline piece. But I would, be, I would love to have more conversation with Grace Church if you would like to continue this offline. Mary, Thanks. just one quickie, uh, 20 seconds. Uh, absolutely, Kristen, listening, but also uh, calling people who may be uh, expressing all kinds of misogynistic, racist, homophobic statements and raising it up to them, not 
just from the, you know, in the public, but really one-on-one -on -one so that people can, can get a clear sense of, you know, if I'm the, the senior warden or I'm, you know, the rector, I'm also an ally. Mm -hmm. um, so. Absolutely, Bill. Absolutely. So with that, I want to be sure that we get some time for a break. So it's 1017, according to my computer clock. I'm going to let you all go on break, but I do need you all back here at um, 1025 so we can continue on with um, Bill's presentation and small group work. And thank you, Kristen. Bravo, bravo. And so we'll see you all at 1025. Um, our next presenter is Bill Thomas. Bill, do you want to say a word about yourself? Sure. Um, yes, I'm delighted to be with you all this morning. Uh, as Mary mentioned earlier, I'm an organization development consultant and Kristen explained what that is um, because my kids have never been able to explain it to anybody else. Um, and I've had the wonderful opportunity to uh, work with parishes in the diocese as well as in Virginia, North Carolina, uh, and also um, two years, uh, three years ago in uh, Utah. Um, Jack Gibb was a Mormon, uh, and, 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 and uh, of course, they're the largest denomination in Utah, but Episcopalians are the second largest denomination, interestingly enough, in, uh, in Utah. So, um, and I, I come to you this morning uh, just paralleling in some ways to what Kristen shared. And I, I, I love her phrase that models are lenses, um, and we can look at, you know, just uh, how organizations and, and small groups uh, develop. Um, I had the opportunity to write something on that for the Alban Institute a long time ago. And um, the other point is that we also go through time um, and we go through having to deal with outside uh, issues. So I, I just want to speak very briefly, put uh, maybe uh, put the pandemic and societal changes of the last year and a half um, in, a, in a context of a model that Mary mentioned earlier, uh, Bill Bridges model of transitions. Um, and, and if you ever get a chance, there's a, uh, there's a, a nice um, a video called Taking Charge of Change. Um, that has been built around that model. Uh, there's a very short um, segment of it on YouTube, but uh, it might be able to be found in other places. So uh, Kristen, do you have that slide for me? Grant. So what I'd like to just mention as we start th th this section is that uh, in terms of what Kristen was talking about, um, so many times we're just kind of going along. Our congregations are going along, uh, going along the status quo, business as usual, whatever you want to call it. And then something changes. Uh, there's an ending. Uh, the rector leaves. Uh, it, Kristen was mentioning some of the key uh, players and stakeholders leave. Um, they mentioned earlier about the merging of two churches. So what ends is a change, an event. Uh, now, some of those are chosen, but some of them, like COVID, are not chosen. Uh, and so all of a sudden, we found ourselves in March of 2020 uh, with our world and uh, changing and, and a lot of things ending. So for example, you know, coming to the church building as such, so what happens in all of these endings is there's a sense of loss. Um, uh, and it was mentioned just a few minutes ago, some of the older people in our congregation, yes, they are saying, oh, why don't these younger people step up? And then when they step up, here's that sense of, oh, well, where do I fit in? Where's that loss? It, it requires letting go, uh, getting closure, um, and, and saying goodbye and recognizing that indeed, um, you know, the church, uh, as we know it, is um, not necessarily the church as we were before, as we'll, we'll come back to it. And then, as a result of that, this transition is a psychological process. So the change to the event, then we have this psychological process that Bridges noted, 
of going through that kind of neutral zone. So we think about the comment earlier about disorganization leading to organization. Um, but before you get to that organization, we have to sort it all out. And this in-between time can, can create a sense of, of chaos, confusion, uh, tension, anxiety for people. Um, I, I actually work inside Johns Hopkins Hospital and uh, we found, for example, that even roles were changing for people. So for the chaplains who pre-COVID pre were spending most of their time with patients during this neutral zone, this time of where do we go? What's going on? Wearing masks, uh, families not being able to come into patient uh, rooms to visit. But the chaplains found themselves having a new role, which was uh, ministering to the staff a lot more than they ever had before. So, and then the longer that neutral zone drags on, the more we're on clarity about, we have on clarity about where we're going. What happens then is that it becomes harder and harder to vision a new reality. So some of you, um, uh, have probably been experiencing that. The vestry hasn't met in person for a year, year and a half, but only now getting back to that. Um, some people on the vestry who uh, never experienced anything other than a Zoom meeting uh, with people. And now they're starting to, we're moving back into um, who we are. And then as we look to who we want to be, uh, as we start to envision those new beginnings, um, we have to, realize it's not getting back to normal. Um, and even the phrase sometimes a new normal uh, can be misleading. Um, however, um, it's so important to recognize what of the familiar are we keeping? And full transparency, I just heard that from my uh, second daughter about three hours ago on Facebook. But I, it's really a helpful notion to keep in mind that in, in our new beginnings, um, we are reinvesting the familiar in the best way that we can be, uh, creating a new chapter. And this could be, as was mentioned earlier, involving new people. The new chapter could in be involving uh, new ethnic groups into a parish that weren't there before. Uh, I had an uncle who was a Catholic priest for 63 years. And in those 63 years, he served in one parish. Uh, when, it, when he first became uh, an assistant, uh, it was pretty much, not pretty much, it was totally white. In the last um, uh, 25 years, it shifted to uh, a lot of people of color, a lot of Hispanic people. My uncle is Irish Catholic, but he rolled with the punches. And, you know, when he passed, uh, the congregation was full of all those quotes new people because he knew how to move uh, into being with, with them and being with the, a new demographic. So uh, one of the things that happens as we go through that transition, and it really is part and parcel of what Kristen was saying, is we have to pay attention to ourselves. We have to pay attention to the feelings. But uh, as she also mentioned, we also have to keep in mind, where do we want to be and how do we get there? Um, and recognizing that in the endings, as she also mentioned, we may be pushed back to having to rebuild trust with each other. Um, and think about that, not just in terms of COVID, but think about that in terms of, say, the last few years of who's a Christian and who's not a Christian. And, you know, all of those things and uh, who's causing trouble in this society versus blah, 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 who's not. So all of that. and. Um, even in some of our congregations, it's the societal um, uh, conflicts. We've had people on both sides and, and we've got to rec reconcile that as well as we move to a new beginning. So um, we are with that just as a framework. And, and again, uh, I just want to point that it says after the change. Well, our beginnings often create uh, the seeds for new beginnings as well. So we're going to be at this point, uh, go ahead and, and putting you into some breakout rooms. Uh, as I recollect, uh, 10, are we thinking, Mary, sometimes as many as that? 
But um, Anakin too we're fewer in numbers, so there might not be quite as many. Okay. But we're trying right. to keep our um our group to six. Good. Okay. And that that please um put your oar in the water, as we say. Uh please pay attention to each other in the spirit of uh, acceptance. Uh listen, but also speak. Uh however, do remember we have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we speak. Not my line, one of those old white Greek philosophers, long dead. Uh, okay, so what are the questions? Um, thinking about the impact of COVID and also all these, mm -hmm. the societal pressures of the last couple of years, particularly, you know, how have they impacted us? So where did COVID cause pinches? Where did it cause that discomfort? Um, and, and that's a reference to another model, which says if we don't deal with the pinches, they start to become crunches. Um, but how significant was it? Uh, what area of primary concern rose up? Was it being present to each other? You know, if you were on the vestry was, oh my gosh, we're not uh, going back to the cornerstone presentation and fiscal issues. Um, you know, our folks are not sending in their pledges mm -hmm. because we're not meeting. But what have we learned out of that, particularly in terms of what has ended, what has been a pinch for us, what's been a challenge for us. And then thinking about, thinking about that neutral zone, the longer this goes on, the less we return to normal. Uh, and it, it, so thinking about that, you know, what is still in flux for us? You know, what are, what are our people wondering about? Um, and then for us, again, as vestry people and in our leadership role, uh, a clergy and non-clergy, um, what tension and anxiety is it causing for us? And then finally, as you're looking to the future and looking for where we move into uh, this ending of 2021 and uh, 2022, what are the seeds of a new beginning that we need to nurture? Uh, going back to the question about younger people coming in, uh, uh, are there folks we need to pay attention to? Are there folks who are particularly feeling this disaffected and alienated and what is the the primary concerns and then uh, how can we do this and remember uh when do we start so by when and by whom so be thinking of those those three areas uh, in terms of endings neutral zone and beginnings uh as you go into your small groups as mary mentioned earlier two things one if somebody can be paying attention uh, we'll be giving you some time reminders, but also uh, if someone can be uh, leading the group, and, you know, not in a formal way, but just simply paying attention to who's speaking, who's not speaking. And thirdly, uh, please, if someone be, uh, would be willing to take some notes, because we will ask for short reports from each of the group at the end of your time together. One other note before we break into groups, and I'll call on you, Adrian. We are in our groups until just before 11.10, and the questions are in the chat box. They are, um, if you go into your chat box and scroll up, um, you will find them. Adrian, you had a question. Bill, thank you so much for bringing um, that change model. Um, I, I love it. And one of the things that I find so important um, in the model, the endings and the neutral zone never go away completely. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, as you were giving it, I was like, that is something that's like, mm -hmm. hey, that um, I want this grief to end. I want the ambiguity to end. And as we travel, even non COVID times, like the new beginning always has even a little layer of neutral zone ambiguity and a layer of grief. And like that you never, in transitions, according to Bridges, you never really, that never goes to zero, even though like we want it, we want to say we've graduated, that's all behind us, we can, right? So I just find it's so helpful to normalize that and just to say, yeah, it's going to hang with us when it's not going away. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Very quickly on that was when we did this in a corporate setting years ago, the, the uh, vice president, CEO made a little video about that. And at the end, he said, uh, and by the way, um, exactly what you just said, changes are always with us. And sure enough, three weeks later, we were working on a change of moving to team oriented uh, organization. Three weeks later, they announced a merger. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's there. 
Thank so you. Thank you so much, Bill. We're going to come back from your group. Like I said, there are no A's for getting through all of it. Get through what you can. They're rich questions. And we will send them out again so that you can use them in your vestry and other settings. So with that, let's go into small groups. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is call on you by room. I hope you kind of remember what room you were in. Um, if not, we'll just have you blurt it out. So what I'd like you to do is as a call room by number, um, if whoever is speaking for that room would um, unmute yourself and uh, share with the rest of the group, that would be grand. And just a reminder, we are sending you these questions. They obviously, were of value to you in terms of being conversation starters. So we're sending them to you so you can use them again. <coughs> so room, oh, let's start in the middle. Room four, if you know who you are. It's Hi, your everybody. Hi, everybody. It's uh, Barry for group, group four. Um, for the first question we had, uh, I think some, some of the uh, bullet points we discussed were um the uh during covid for the pension or the, the lack people um the lack of growth for our uh, youth programs um a compression in volunteering and serving amongst amongst the parishioners uh where we were not able to get a, a we were not able to grow more more people serving serving the church what that that needed to happen um and and recognizing that we're a different church than we than we were when COVID started, um, coming to the, those aspects, um, we kind of glossed over question number two. But for resolving things, um, uh, one of the good aspects I heard for like we basically embraced. Uh, there was a, a good number of people that embraced uh, face FaceTime um, for d doing services. Uh, that seemed to work well. Um, we had. Uh, some tr uh, transitions uh, from like one of the first people of uh, parishes had a, a, a rector transit uh, rector was transitioning out so they had issues with that, uh, along with some other um, thefts and stuff like that that, 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 that they were dealing with um, other ones were dealing with um, sexual predators with, within the parish and, and have, splitting the splitting those up um, among the parishioners dealing dealing with those but uh, one of the aspects I, th I thought was good was there was a um, for the FaceTime um, for people for, for singing uh, the, the person would sing a solo on a video uh, and then send it send it in so there 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 still could be singing at, at church I thought that was a, a, a good premise that we had there um, and then the building of natural hosp uh, hospitality of actually engaging people that that you're able to and being genuine with asking what how the how they're doing um not just saying hey i missed you, I, I missed you at church actually ha ha showing um aspects of caring aspect like that making sure that you're gen generally care about the person um and then wrecking and then um uh the building up of uh the youth in the church and putting resources and putting resources and people and um and in, into those aspects to build to build the church from the youth groups up so that's a group four heads so. up Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else from group four that needs to add into that? Then how about room one? I can speak, I, I can speak to that. Um, we had a, a lot of, there were a lot of similarities for the first question causing of pinches. Um, was the, the wide variety of comfort levels that people in our parishes had. Um, you know, the, some people got irritated by the vec, uh, rector wearing gloves, other doing the Eucharist, others didn't feel that, you know, the rector was dressed appropriately enough. Uh, Zoom vestry meetings, uh, 
also the uh, budget pinch caused by the technology by sudden technology needs that hadn't been foreseen. Uh, but also uh, serving up as a, a growth opportunity. Um, other thing, other pinches were uh, the general anxiety and uncertainty leadership stove pipes, uh, whereas it had been more decentralized. Now you've got two or three leaders that are are deciding and leading in everything. Um, it exacerbating what it were previously disruptive transitions. Uh, one of our members is going through a rector transition where a longtime rector retired, but uh, imagine that happening in the middle of COVID. And also, um, and best remembers being lost in the whole process. Our, our second question, what it, what is still in flux? Um, uh, Rector's having to change, having to uh, shift gears and their output now being much more increased, especially in uh, in offering daily services or becoming content providers and content creators. Whereas I, I don't think they have a course in seminary on uh, on YouTube and, and Instagram. Uh, also, uh, and I, I love this, what, what is still in flux is uh, one of our members there, their vestry has made a, a stated goal of not using the word normal. Because what is normal? There, there is no such thing right now. So they're not, there's not going back to normal. There's no new normal. There's just no normal. And as far as seeds to nurture, embracing the technology, uh, that there's, there's multiple ways uh, of us connecting now as church. It, it's, it, it's so much broader. Uh, whether it's whether it's over the internet or in person, masked and distance, um, and there's funding as we've had. We have this much larger congregation, but how do you get them to give? And so, if you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> and, uh, but also, the what's transitioned is how we ask for money and how we receive it. So the, the, the benefit and advent of PayPal has actually saved, our, saved my church's bacon. So that's, that's where we're at. That's... Thank you, David. Um, so here is, you don't get seminary courses in TikTok either. Way <laughs> after my time in seminary. Um, so anybody else from uh, room one that wanted to chime in or add anything? Okay, then room five. Do you remember who you are? To go back and look. I'm thinking that's the one that had Grace and uh, my congregation or- Yeah, I think yes. that may be right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, was Pam taking notes or someone? Um, I'm trying not to always jump to be a leader. I'm leader a lot. I did not take notes. Have at it. Okay, <laughs> Steve, somebody want to speak? See, I'm leading. I don't want to lead. Uh, Go for it, Margaret. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I guess uh, what was really wonderful, and I better put the questions up here so I can look at it. Um, uh, is that we found some similarities in some of the things that we were uh, speaking about, but we also found like the congregation, uh, especially Grace had put some things in place that um, with their outdoor services and their um, drive up or parking lot services that were helping not only during the pinch time and how they're dealing with the pinch, but also nurturing for the future. Um, some of the pinches, uh, somebody just mentioned about a long-term um, uh, rector leaving. Uh, this is what I came into. He had been there for 41 years. And so being in there during that area, we were already coming into influx. And then adding that, um, a lot of primary concerns for people 
if I'm recalling correctly, and please raise your hand, Renee or anyone, Steve, to correct, but um, were the, the numbers of people, uh, the lesser numbers uh, in the congregation who were actually participating and the financial ramifications of that. Um, some people's reactions to wearing masks, um, being in a proximity, there was a major uh, concern about losing the social aspect of the, um, you know, uh, for many people, and I know that was a fact out here at St. Thomas, really enjoying those coffee hours and the types of things that were happening with that. Um, that idea of the tension anxiety um, that is causing for many people um, just simply re, I guess, changing some of the roles of people. And um, please jump in here, somebody, Pam or somebody, if I'm saying something. Uh, we even have three people together at a table at Grace. Uh, <laughs> but, but that idea that I did not hear in anyone uh, a loss of hope. And what I was very encouraged about is that there was a reality. Uh, people were seeing things clearly and actually looking at it in a way that, wait, this is what we have. This is what we need to work with and how do we go on? And uh, for instance, those of you who were speaking about some of the concerns about technology, just learning that technology. I was jealous about the group that has continued being outdoors. And I wish that we had done that because we're just making it better. Oh, and one major statement that was made, um, wait, maybe I already said it. So um, that seeds of the new beginning is, um, that's what we were just starting to work on. And we had some thoughts. So if we had had a little bit more time, but I think it was very healthy for us to be able to speak about what had happened and right. what was happening in the, how it was affecting our congregation. So you did a great job. You did yes. a great job, Mark. Thank okay. you for capturing all that. <laughs> I feel I left something out. Yep. <laughs> Just Try remember, not to lead. <laughs> Just remember there's an A for doing the exercise and I just, we're gonna send you the questions again. They're really important conversations for us to be having. So use them again. This is part of the, we hope, the gift of the day. So I'm going to turn to uh, room eight. That's the last group. Oh. I think that would be us, am I correct? Yes. Andy, George. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we, um, for the first one, talking about challenges on what we have learned. Uh, one of the challenge was a drop off in plate offerings and pledges. Um, new members, uh, it was, uh, well, that was something that, you know, people did, our church, for instance, did get new members coming on. There was a loss of members to death and not necessarily always due to COVID. Staying technologically connected for some of the groups was a challenge. Uh, some were using iPads uh, at the very beginning. Uh, some members not knowing how to use Zoom and having a steep learning curve there. Um, not having, you know, the appropriate equipment being a challenge. They were um, also challenges in terms of uh, the a primary challenge was having people lost to COVID and not being able to have funerals or be with the families or mourning together um, was a big challenge. Certainly, um, one of the things that came out of that that was good and learning was that people were able to connect more broadly, having people in the service virtually from all over the country. Uh, having members become more savvy as a result of needing to use technology to become connected and you, having uh, more creativity in terms of how things were done. For example, there were Christmas pageants, there were choirs that were doing ensembles, um, there's a birthday party. Um, um, the uh, 
second question talking about being still in flux, the giving, uh, if people were not coming into the church, then some of them were not using online uh, opportunities for giving, trying to put everything together uh, is a challenge. Stewardship is a little more challenging now and having to be creative in how that gets done. Getting people from other parishes logging into the service is, is also a wonderful thing. We talked a little bit about us also having the opportunity to uh, have services at the National Cathedral, uh, which was a good thing. People getting them back into the parish might be something that is challenging right now. Uh, people are just comfortable having Zoom meetings, having no commute times, and uh, that is something that's a little bit difficult. Um, uh, we've discovered that it is critical to continue having online services. Uh, it, it's just the way it is now. People uh, either who don't have access are having to, are relying on that now. So having these things being more permanent and setting up structures that are more permanent so that services can continue. Uh, a challenge in that sense is also making sure that when you have both traditional and contemporary services, how do you merge that so you are meeting the needs of both those very different congregations? Uh, we talked about missing the human contact uh, after services in that fellowship, even though many have moved to more virtual coffee hours, but still having that element of just a hug or um, missing the wine too, uh, having a dry wafer. We talked about it could be a little hard coming down. Um, but uh, on that third piece, what do we nurture? Certainly that need for fellowship. Um, the congregational events, having even those many congregations are back in, it's certainly not anywhere close to the numbers that it used to be. Um, and part of the challenge is how do we have, how do we make our congregations feel comfortable enough to come into services? We talked a little bit too about not knowing how, if everybody is vaccinated or not, and some surprises there, and just having how all that is connected to people being more comfortable to being in the same space. Um, I think that is pretty much everything. If anyone else in the group wants to add on to that. What a rich group. Thank you. And so let's turn it over to group but to room two. Sorry about that. A lot of what's been said was 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 also mentioned in our group. Uh, apologies, I just done uh, muting when a phone rang in this house. Um, question is, uh, who are members? Uh, basically, we don't see. Um, everybody so you know are people still connected uh another as somebody mentioned earlier you know some uh issues being exacerbated by covid so for example for saint michael's and all angels holy covenant was closed and people were coming to uh saint michael's and all angels and guess what uh they started coming two weeks before covid so so bang they're here and then they're not here Kind of, uh, and the whole issue of uh, the technologically uh, adept versus um, maybe not as adept, uh, people not as savvy, is a real pinch for people being able to get on or not get on. And and I know in some churches that, given the nature the demographics of the population, it was a big issue. Um, and then uh, even though uh, we started to open up, people still had anxiety about coming back. Um, and even being present, but not being able to sing. Um, and then um, Adrian shared her perspective of uh, from being the rector, being the pastor. She had this wonderful image of uh, all my sheep are free range. And um, as an old English teacher, I would have given her a plus for you know uh, a metaphor. But it's so true um, that 
you can't see them. Where are they? You know, out there. And then, then I, uh, as she t talked about that, recognizing then the role of the good shepherd and, and trusting, um, and, you know, that, 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 yes, you know, God will take care. Uh, a few other things, flux, uh, when we will return, you know, how do we adapt? Um, and, uh, and then w one of our members, uh, Celestine mentioned, you know, it's all about adapting to change. It's needing to think outside the, uh, the box, uh, looking at technology as a blessing. Mm -hmm. And, and then how do we make new connections and recognize that, that maybe the seeds were uh, new connections during uh, COVID. Uh, and in particular, uh, one person mentioned, uh, two people mentioned being in connection with folks internationally that they hadn't been in connect, you know, then to be able to them, for them to be part of our uh, worship, for example. And, and, and also recognizing those unplanned gifts that that just have come but to recognize that but the basic question in the new seeds category is you know how do we be become community together and so um you know even even if we're not in person uh perhaps our the soup of our existence is maybe a little thinner um but uh it's still possible and then the last point in terms of you know something that was lost and i hadn't heard that this so far was the opportunity of uh, working with other congregations oh. so so issues like shared ministry and um, all kinds of things like that and not being able to be part of that so um, i'm mindful of time so i wanted to be very quick uh anything else that i left out uh room two Thank you all. I see, I see a few thumbs up. Thank you so much for this gift. Uh, room seven, we're, we're close, closing in on our last couple of rooms. Room seven. So room seven, we had a lot of uh, commonality, but basically for our pinches, we had the pinch of technology and connection, that really deep desire to be together. And for some folks that felt a little cold with using technology, um, there were also the pinch of transition as well as the loss of connection in the surrounding community that was caused by the pandemic. And we focused more uh, in the second question on what we had learned and what we valued as opposed to the flux that we were feeling. So we really learned that con connection in worship and in community is essential for the congregations that we're all part of and that being together in person is really, really important. So there's that tension of technology and habit that stems from that, the, the fear that, um, there'd be a loss of the habit of going to church and being together. And then also the tension of transition for one of the members of the group. Um, and yet in, in the midst of all of that, there were the seeds of hope in that um, there are congregations that are working to welcome new folks and really making that a priority in their ministry, as well as another congregation that's really beginning to explore its identity a little bit deeper. Any other comments from room seven? Thank you. Uh, room three, we're down to our final two rooms. So for, um, for our room, uh, we um, talked about, uh, you know, as far as pinch is uh, being, you know, similar to what some of others have said is uh, the technology piece. Um, uh, we, we realize that especially for uh, some of our elderly or senior um, congregants, that we kind of lost them, especially when we had to shift to, you know, uh, live streaming or YouTube or online and communicating a lot more by email. Um, we we lost some of them. And I, I, and I shouldn't say lost them, but we kind of lost a connection with them. And it's, you know, all about, well, you know, as we're now starting to transition back in, how do we reconnect and, and get them back into the fold? Um, so, you know, there is variability in our group as far as on the technology piece, uh, because one of our church, one of the churches in our group had already started using online streaming, you know, years ahead. So they were, it was an easier transition for them. But um, for 
like at our church at St. James, we weren't using technology that much. And so therefore it was a little bit of a harder transition. Um, one of the things that, uh, the, the pinches that we also realized is that, you know, caused us to shift pretty quickly as far as business continuity. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, corporations and businesses, you know, they talk a lot about, you know, business continuity. What happens if there's a disruption in business? How do we continue to make money as, as a business? But um, on our side, I, I think that we kind of, not kind of, we just didn't really look at it that much as far as what kind of impact it was going to have on our church when there was a disruption like this. We didn't see it coming, but therefore, it, but we, and we didn't, you know, we just didn't plan ahead as we needed to, to make sure that, well, you know, we kept everybody engaged. Um, things that were flux for us, it's not, uh, similar to what somebody else had mentioned. We're not sure who's here and who's not. Um, you know, some people are have gotten comfortable with online and they don't feel the need to come back into the building. But we're not sure if they're here or not. You know, some people give, some people don't. Um, um, so that is a little bit of a challenge in just making sure that, well, okay, who's here and, and you know, how, how can we make sure that we reach out to those who are not? Uh, the other thing that is a little bit of a challenge when you think of who's here and, and who's not is also going to be on um, the drain of the, the resources that you have, especially if you have less people who are... Um, who are now stepping forward to be your next leaders. So to give an example, if for instance it well, you know, a lot of people are not necessarily committing to uh, saying, well, you know what, I'll be on the vestry and I'll do this and I'll st step up to a leadership role because they're not even sure about what's going to be going on in their lives. So, you know, some may be thinking about relocating, some, you know, because the pandemic may have caused a change in their life. That lack of commitment is not necessarily there. And therefore, we're having a little bit, or at least in our church, we're having a little bit of a of a, a strain in being able to find your next leaders because you know that commitment is not as there as it was before. Um, since for new beginning, one of the things that it has opened our eyes is that well, we now have access to a world out there of uh, of people who are interested in church but just are not committed to the kind of structure that we were used to in that, well, okay, there's a Sunday morning service at 9.30 at such and such building, and this is your community. Um, so there's a, we can see a bit of a generational shift in that people are interested, they're, they're still interested in the church, but they're not necessarily wanting to be tied to that kind of a structure. So it's all about how can we reach out to them? How can we connect? and keep them engaged because they're still interested in ministries, they're still interested in communities and still interested in causes, but um, but just not necessarily tied to the structure. So, um, you know, one of the churches in our group said, well, you know, they've got a connect button that, that they have on their website, you know, to kind of let bring people in. And then once that, once that person shows interest, then there's a whole team that that, you know, connects with them and says, all right, you know, what are you interested in? How can we help you, you know, to try to bring them in? So, um, so there's hope there, you know, there's great news, but, uh, but we definitely can see challenges ahead. Uh, we just have to nurture those. So in our remaining time, thank you so much, James. Um, we have one more group and that's group six. Hello, um, I'm representing group six. And we had a very um, lively and robust discussion. Um, I'll just provide some highlights because most of what we talked about um, has already been brought up by other groups um, to uh, address what some of the pinches were. There was a congregation um, in our group that was so small that they weren't able to maintain social distancing when um, they actually returned to in-person service. In fact, they um, opened and then had to close, which actually caused more trauma. Um, there was a realization 
that we will um, always probably have an online presence and that's not the same. There was a strong desire to be in a community. Um, also, as was previously mentioned, finances caused a pinch. Um, and there's a fear that people won't return, um, that they, um, there's also a, a fear and people are afraid of what they don't know might be coming down the pike. Um, there was also a concern about the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and that it took place during the pandemic and now we really need to take a look at reparations and uh, taking a look at how we do things and um, and uh, just you know review of that whole process. Um, there was a loss in the ability to visit and to personally contact each other, especially with um, the elderly and uh, people who were homebound. Um, one congregation was um, experienced or had uh, a new priest who started right before the pandemic. So there were challenges with the priest knowing the congregation and knowing um, the uh, membership. There's a lot of mistrust with the um, older community in terms of technology. We still have um, a lot of issues with technology and being able to use it properly. And um, there are some older and elderly members who feel disconnected. So um, those were the pinches. The second question um, <clears throat> regarding um, it being harder to return, we sort of addressed that in uh, the first question. So the third question with regard to the seeds that we need uh, to nurture, we are looking at homebound and older members and trying to just keep them connected because as we previously discussed, a lot are feeling disconnected and don't have the means to stay connected with um, the technology. And we are uh, reviewing, rebuilding during and after the uh, pandemic. Um, one congregation is trying to uh, rebuild and uh, the rector has recently um, submitted a letter of resignation. So there are um, challenges with that. Um, some of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, have worked in uh, rebuilding community have been uh, one congregation sent out Christmas cards, mm. um, another congregation sent out notes, um, a congregation sent out Valentine cards and all of these things went over uh, very well with members of the uh, congregation as well as um, a congregation delivered cookies to its uh, members. Um, another thing was uh, a congregation created and sent out certificates of achievement for parents uh, during the pandemic and the certificate just said, you know, uh, your certificate of achievement for outstanding parenting during uh, the pandemic and they were delivered with a little goodie bag to all of the school age parents. We saw um, people join online and um, there we are looking at ways to follow up with the people who uh, join us online and, and uh, one congregation um, is taking a look at who is viewing online and anyone who has hit the like button, they're reaching out to them to um, connect with them to see if they are interested in coming to church in person. Um, we also want to um, continue to um, use the uh, home communion kits because those uh, were uh, very helpful in making sure that everyone received um, communion. And if um, 
anyone else from group six has anything to add. Thank you. Thank you. That is such a good summary and so many pragmatic things to reach out to people individually and collectively. So thank you all of you who are in all of the groups for all of this. Um, as you've probably guessed by now, we are heavy into practicing what we preach. So you heard about trust theory, Gib, um, the Gibbs trust theory, you heard about um, transitions um, and in these questions, we were helping you wrestle down both of those ideas so that you understand these are not just theories, these are not just explanations, these are things to practice. And I certainly hear, certainly did hear a lot of the, the striving that people have, the desire and yearning people have um, to really get clear about what it means to be a member again. Plus some pretty practical things about how to keep people feeling connected. So thank you all so much for this. I really appreciate it. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Stuart Wright and to his uh, small group of folks from the Comp and Benefits um, Committee of the Diocese. We're going to talk a bit about compensation and benefits um, for clergy and lay folks in the coming years. So Stuart, it's all yours. Thank you, Mary. Our first person to speak is Ann Gross from Middleham and St. Peter's. Hello, I'm Ann Gross, and right now I'm the chair of the Compensation and Benefits Committee. This committee was established by uh, Canon 1-140 of the diocese, and the purpose is to recommend various compensation and benefits related needs within the diocese. You know, it can be salary, it can be personnel practices, insurance, whatever. Um, we prepare the annual resolution that generally is resolution number one at the convention that says, okay, compensation, here's what the increase should be in your, in your clergy and lay people salary and so forth. Um, we review insurance plans and programs and um, make sure we have appropriate ones. Um, on the committee are six elected members, typically, Two are elected each year, three of the elected are clergy and three are lay people. We also have um, appointed members. Typically the appointed members um, have some sort of personnel expertise or background or knowledge or interest. Right now there are eight members on the committee, um, including Stuart Wright, who is a wonderful, um, um, source of knowledge about benefits and compensation in general and what's going on in the rest of the church because that does help us. All right, now Liz Healy is going to talk next about actual compensation. Liz, you're muted. Sorry about that, barking dog in the background. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for hanging in there with us. Uh, and now I get to talk about money, which I know is terribly exciting. But I'd like to go back to something before I, um, I get into my presentation is back to something Jay said very early on in that screenshot that he showed, where it says, it basically talks about budget and I feel stupid and what does SICA mean? I'm a current parish treasurer. I'm a former senior warden of St. John's in Kingsville. And the best piece of encouragement I can give you is to do everything you can to know your finances, to know where your money goes. And obviously a large part of that is in, in clergy and lay compensation. So I'm gonna share my screen and I hope everyone can see this. Yes. Good deal. This is an example, and I will say that again. This is an example of the, a worksheet for clergy compensation. We get into acronyms all the time, and one of the things on Jay's presentation was SICA what? What is SICA? Well, anyone that is employed outside of self-employment, outside of clergy, you'll see on your pay stub FICA. SICA is pretty much the same thing. And basically it's a payment to the federal government for social security and Medicare benefits. 
So that is what Sika is. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the left hand side of this first, which is housing provided. So if you provide a rectory for your clergy, oh, and this is also based on full time. So if you're a three quarter time or half time clergy, you need to make the appropriate changes. Um, this is based on full time clergy and there is a cash stipend, the salary. Now, um, church pension fund has what they call a rule of 30. If you provide housing, 30% of that cash stipend is assumed to be up to the fair market value of the rectory that is provided. That number gets added in to what becomes another acronym, TAC. If your parish provides utilities, um, an equity allowance, those are also added in. And then if you're within your agreement with your clergy, if you also do agree to pay half of the SICA self-employment tax, which would be FICA, uh, which your employer, if you're employed outside of clergy, that's your employer's responsibility. Now, some parishes lump all of these numbers into a cash compensation. This is all negotiable. You, you know, please have an open and honest conversation with your rector. I can't stress that enough. Both sides have it, as we did on this committee, we had several very open and honest conversations from between the laity and between the clergy in understanding the positions of a parish and a clergy. Um, so please have an open and honest conversation about where the church is in finances and what the rector needs in terms of finances and what is you know, appropriate for their level of experience, their level of education for the job requirements. So I digressed a tad, but I'm gonna get back to um, following down this column. When you add all of those items up and the items highlighted in green are what I call cash out of pocket. Those are payables. You get to the TAC, the total assessable com uh, compensation. Part of the committee's responsibility, as Ann said, is to put out basically a recommendation that will be at convention of based on size of congregation and years of service, years since ordination, what the minimum TAC should be or is recommended to be for clergy. So TAC does not mean total accessible cash. It means total accessible compensation. So this grid will be published at after it's uh, passed by convention. And I believe every parish receives a copy of it. Um, so you can figure out on this grid where you where it's recommended that you be. Um, in terms of a median, high, low, gets a little complicated. So the importance of a TAC, not only in what is the compensation provided for the clergy, that TAC is what the church pension fund based your pension assessment on. So the church pension fund then takes 18% of that TAC, which should be updated annually. You should get something from the church pension fund where you update what benefits you are providing to your rector, benefits exclusive of health and pension. Um, and that's how they base the pension payment. So if you go down to item number two, where it says benefits, that 12,828 is 18% of the TAC, total accessible compensation. And then in addition to that, parishes are responsible for providing health insurance. Um, now this is a health insurance calculation for the rector only. I picked the mid-level plan. We also we, um, approved three plans that are available for clergy and laity, I believe, um, that they can pick from. So I picked the mid-range and I picked for rector only. And then, you know, uh, life and regular life insurance is included. There are is dental insurance um, that would be additional. Um, and then there are some optional benefits which are not included because they're optional. 
So you can see the total benefits to the clergy under housing provided is 95,872. The cash responsibility by the parish in this formula is 81,000. The big difference is the housing is provided. And then there are some miscellaneous expenses. Um, congregations are responsible for reimbursement in the course to the rector for travel expenses. Now that's not from home to work. That's if you go to a hospital and make a visit or you're doing home communions, those uh, are, and sometimes clergy will want to not receive a reimbursement. They'll want to take that off of their taxes. Um, and then if you know sabbatical is coming up, it's a good idea to start a sabbatical leave fund because not only will you have the responsibility of continuing to pay your clergy, but you will also have the responsibility of perhaps a, a long-term supply or you know, however else you'll need to do with that. So if we hop over to the other column, uh, if housing is not provided, then a cash compensation comes into play. And again, these are negotiable. Please talk to your clergy, talk to your vestry, understand where both parties are coming from. So if housing is not provided, there is a cash compensation paid directly to the clergy. And traditionally utilities and an equity allowance then are not applicable. The self-employment tax, if your parish chooses to pay that separately from, uh, from the cash compensation. You come up with the TAC, and I don't know how I backed into this, but the numbers worked out exactly. So you have the same TAC. 18% of that total assessable compensation becomes the pension premium, and then the health insurance. And the total benefits came out to exactly the same number. I still don't know how I did that. This is a, an Excel spreadsheet, by the way, that I just, so as you populate the cells, the formulas calculate. So if housing is not provided, the total, total parish responsibility is higher because you are compensating for housing um, for the clergy. So I know I blew through this in, in a pretty quick um, explanation, but I think it's important that we understand, you know, the benefit structure and what is expected. And um, I'm going to digress for a second be before I go to the second part, which is COLA, cost of living adjustment. Um, and I'm going to be very honest as a parishioner and as a treasurer. It's very easy for vestries, particularly in a time when contributions are down, when we're feeling stressed to say, this is the biggest part of our budget, and it is. We need to cut the rector's time. We need to cut the rector's pay. Um, that's why I'm encouraging honest and open conversations. It may be that that is what needs to happen, but do everything you can to understand your budgets, understand where money is going, understand that okay, why is our BGE out of whack this year and it wasn't last year? What is happening? Can we contact BGE Smart Energy? We, a couple years ago, um, brought BGE in. They retrofitted all the lights in our parish hall to now be LED compliant. That saved us $100 a month. That may not sound like a lot, but by the end of the year, that's a health premium and a half. Um, talk to your insurance company, shop your insurance. Uh, Brotherhood Mutual is who we're with. It's also church insurance. Call them. There is a formula that automatically increases the replacement cost of your building. Sometimes that gets out of whack and it's too much. They can reduce that amount and save you some money. Think about increasing your deductible. Okay, so it might be $50 a month, it might be $100 a month. Every little bit helps. Um, you know, funny enough, trash removal. We pay a trash company to come in and come to find out that our county will come and pick up our trash at no charge. $167 a month. So it's incumbent on us as vestry members, and I really digress here and I apologize, but it's incumbent upon us as vestry members to understand where our money goes. 
We are fiscally responsible. Um, you know, this may be a time when pet projects or cows need to be seriously thought about, funded in different ways or not funded at all. And if the open and honest conversation really comes down to, we can only do a three quarter time clergy, then your congregation, make your congregation a part of that conversation. Um, and my last little bit is COLA. Cost of, if you hear COLA, another acronym thrown around, and COLA is the cost of living increase. Now, there are two ways we can get that number. One is Social Security, and one is the Consumer Price Index. At this point in time, I believe in our resolution, it is a suggested 5% increase for clergy and laity, lay employees. The conventional wisdom, Social Security Administration has not made that determination yet. Consumer price index is generally right in the same range. If you follow it on the news, it's looking like because of inflation and everything that's been going on, they may recommend as high as a 6% increase in the cost of living adjustment for Social Security. So I believe in, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the resolution being presented will say a recommended 5% increase. Um, however, that may need to be amended once the federal government or consumer price index is finally determined at the end of the year. Um, it does say 5%. Okay. Um, and I know that that was a really quick breeze through and, and you know, I apologize if I went through that too quickly and, and some of you couldn't quite follow, um, but I'm sure that we would be more than happy to, if you have specific questions or talk to anyone about it, review it. Um, that is it for me. And it is my honor to introduce Jason Poling for his presentation. Thank you, Liz. If I can ask you to stop sharing so I can. Uh, the one uh, the one thing I do need to follow up your presentation with yes, is please. Um, it, it is actually no longer possible for clergy to take uh, deductions for unreimbursed employee expenses. That was taken away from us a few years ago. Um, so what I want to talk about uh, in this clickbait presentation is the one little trick the IRS doesn't want you to know about that lets you save 50% or more on all of your professional expenses. Uh, and um, I would uh, encourage you to use the raise hand feature because I can only see so many little boxes on my screen as I go through this. So uh, just the other week, I bought a commentary uh, by Jacob Milgram. Uh, this is the first of his three volume commentaries on Leviticus. It uh, retails for $85. And unfortunately, uh, many of these uh, high quality commentaries really don't get discounted because either you need them or you don't. So either you buy them or you don't. So if your typical uh, clergy person at your, at your parish, who is, of course, uh, trying to prepare excellent sermons, uh, needs resources like this to do that, uh, then they need to, of course, spend the money to do that. So let's say you pay your priest $85, and that $85 needs to be spent for a commentary. Well, the first thing the priest is going to do, of course, like all of us, is going to give away 10% of that as tithe, 10% uh, off of the gross pay because Jesus gets paid before Uncle Sam does. And then after tithing, the priest is going to pay 15.3% SICA, payroll tax, because most of our parishes do not do the half, uh, the, the employer's half of the contribution. Uh, most clergy have to pay the full 15.3% in payroll tax. And that's payable on both salary and on uh, housing allowance. So if, like me, uh, you take a housing allowance rather than receiving um, uh, the use of a rectory, uh, you have to pay uh, your payroll tax on that full amount. You're only, you, your income tax is reduced by the amount of the housing allowance, but you have to pay seek on the whole thing. Uh, now, uh, the, the uh, clergy person is going to pay federal income tax on that. 22% uh, uh, is kind of a, a rough number. Uh, it should be right around the median of where most of our folks are. And state income tax of 4.75 for all of us. And then our counties are a little different. Uh, but 3% is about the average. So after tithing and paying taxes, a clergy person is going to pay $44.90 on that. Now, the 52.82% uh, doesn't add up all the numbers above it because you get to deduct the payroll tax when you calculate the income tax. So what that means then is that uh, you're paying the clergy person $129.90 to buy an $85 book, right? 
that means that you're wasting $32.40. I'm never going to call tithe money wasted, but all those taxes, I will. So you're wasting $32.40 if you're paying the clergy person $129.90, except you're actually not paying the clergy person $129.90. Because if you're going to take those percentages off of a number to get to $85, you actually have to pay $180.16 in order to yield $85 after tithe and taxes, right? So, it, and this is how the numbers work out. Uh, total amount of tithe and taxes paid on that is $95.16. I'm going to take tithe off that because that's never wasted, but you are wasting $77.14 in order to enable your clergy person to buy an $85 book, right? But it gets worse. Uh, the church has to pay by canon an 18% pension assessment. All money paid to the clergy is salary or is housing allowance. Uh, or is seek offsets or allowances uh, is subject to an 18% assessment to the church pension group. So the church is paying an additional $32.43. And then with, when you add in what the priest pays in tithes and taxes, you're looking at $127.59 paid on that money uh, that is uh, functionally, except for the tithe, being wasted. So this clergy person to buy an $85 book has to have $212.59 of the church's money put out. Now, I don't want to use overly technical accounting terms, but I think a good word for that is stupid. Okay? Um, you should be treating as professional expenses, reimbursable professional expenses, everything that you possibly can, whether it be commentaries or uh, conferences, retreats, travel to diocesan events, travel to the hospital, travel for home communion. Carl Barth said a, a pastor should prepare his sermons with a Bible on one knee and a newspaper on the other. Expense the newspaper subscription. Um, Charles Clone tells a story of when he was called as a rector. He uh, negotiated his compensation and then he immediately said, okay, I'd like you to take $1,000 off of that and put it into an expense account that I can use. Uh, for taking people to lunch and for sending flowers and for uh, whatever other ministry related expenses I have. That would be about 4,000 in today's money. Uh, and that's not, that's not too high a number. So that's for an $85 commentary. What about for a conference? $1,000 is not an unreasonable number. If you're going away to a conference for a few days, you got to get there and back. They're going to charge you to stay there. There's going to be registration fees. In that case, you're spending out $2,500 in order for your priest to go to a thousand dollar conference. But wait, there's more. Let's say your priest is doing a doctor of ministry program. So I am one of those clergy who is part-time. I have a three quarter time position at St. Andrew's Pasadena. The other quarter of my time, I direct the doctor of ministry program at St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute. Now in round numbers, if you take the tuition and fees and books and research expenses, that's gonna be about $20,000. Um, if you want your priest to go through further study to earn a doctor of ministry, if you are not going to do that smartly, you're going to pay out $50,000 for a $20,000 program, which again, I would argue is not the best stewardship of money. So in those honest conversations that you're having with your clergy as you negotiate compensation, talk about characterizing a portion of their income as reimbursable expenses. The other benefit that that gives you, and I'll stop sharing at this point, is that if clergy have these funds available to them for things that are going to enable them to develop professionally, that are going to enable them to be restored spiritually, to be stimulated intellectually, uh, to have the resources that they need to do their work well, uh, it, it's a whole lot easier for a priest to decide to go to a conference if they're not having to decide whether they go to the conference or send their kid to camp for a month, for a week. Uh, or if they have to decide whether they can buy a new commentary set uh, or, or pay for their, uh, their, their kid's uh, extra ballet lesson. Um, you will enable your priests to be happier. You will enable them to be more effective. Uh, and, you will and, and you will enable everybody to use the resources God has entrusted to us much more wisely uh, if you will make uh, all ministry expenses you possibly can uh, reimbursable rather than forcing your priests to pay for those with after-tax income. Thank you, Jason. Now, Stuart. Now, Stuart, anything else? So what I'd like to say is uh, a reminder that uh, as the HR guy for the diocese, I'm always available to help out with stuff related to compensation and benefits. 
And I'll close with a reminder that under our canons, all of our lay people are to be offered the same level of benefits as our clergy employees. And so if you have any questions about that, reach out to me at the diocesan offices and I'll be happy to walk you through that and explain the implications. So that's it from us. Thanks to all for paying attention. Mary. Thank you. Um, I'm very appreciative of this. Um, this is a sort of extra bonus work that we don't get a chance to do as much of at diocesan convention. And I'm particularly appreciative of the admonition from this group to really have the hard conversation. But part of that is saying, can we reimburse you for things rather than paying you money? You buy it yourself and then it's all that rigmarole around that. And um, uh, there is great advantage to this, especially because in 2017, when other taxes were cut, a whole lot of benefit stuff that was reimbursable for business went out the window with it. Um, I found out to my dismay when I moved into my own office at home. Um, so just just in time to not have that be advantageous in any way anymore, any, anyhow. So, and any of you who are working from home also know the pain of that. So thank you all for this. And thank you all for being with us. I'm looking at the time, which is 12, 11, and I have no more to offer you on this day, except to thank you for your time, to end you in prayer, and to also ask if Kirk DeVore is still on this call, because I'd sure like to have a deacon dismiss us when I pray, after I pray. Kirk, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, great, Kirk, thank you. So I'm gonna say, close this with a prayer and then I'm gonna ask you to, to dismiss us and just remind you all that much of this is coming your way in a great big email. Um, so once again, thank you. Um, so let us pray. Draw your church together, O oh God, into one great company of disciples, together following our Lord Jesus Christ into every walk of life, together serving him in his mission to the world and together witnessing to his love on every continent and every island forever and ever. Amen. 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 Kirk? Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks to God. Be to God. God. Alleluia. 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 Thank you all.